uh, George Sinclair, Rector of Church of the Messiah here in Ottawa. Welcome to our leisurely stroll through the book of Revelation. Uh, today we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter uh, 18, verses 4 to 8, and 20 to 24. And uh, so while you get your Bibles, because uh, we're going to read it, uh, let's just have a quick prayer. Uh, Father, uh, we ask that you help us to understand the world around us. Uh, some of us have jobs that require that, of course, as scientists or accountants or politicians or business people or just ordinary house husbands and house wives. Uh, but Father, we ask that more than understanding the world from the worldly point of view, that you make us students of your word and that your word, that Jesus would speak through your word deeply into each of our hearts that we might understand the true perspective of the world that comes only from you, and, uh, and that we understand in light of the cross and in light of the fact that Christ is the hope of glory. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, your Son and our Savior. Amen. So, um, is God just or fair? I mean, that's a very, very good question. Is God just? Is God fair? One of the things which the Bible says is that at the end of the end of the end of the end, uh, and it says here in a, it's going to be saying this here in a, in a poem form, if you look at it in Romans chapter 2, where you get it more in a philosophical, theological form, is the message that at the end of the end of the end, when, God, when people see how God judges human beings, that no one will have an excuse, no one will have a good argument, uh, everyone will understand that God has been fair. We might not like his fairness, but everyone w will understand that he is fair. And some of these things are talked about here in Revelation chapter 18. And as I shared, uh, Revelation 17 depicture, depictures, uh, <laughs> depicts, depicts, not depictures, depicts, um, uh, in a sense, worldly power. It's been described in different images up until now, and it uses the image of the great prostitute named Babylon, and uh, it's riding the beast. Uh, in other words, earthly power thinks it can ride, it can use the devil uh, for its own means, but the devil is going to ultimately be bigger. And chapter 17 ends with parts of the beast devouring the great prostitute. Now we switch perspectives. We have a different showing. And what we're going to see now is it's like a musical, as I shared last week. There's two songs uh, at the beginning, two songs at the end, and in between there are three songs. The two songs at the beginning and the two songs at the end are, in a sense, God's perspective on the judgment of earthly power represented by Babylon, the great prostitute. And the middle three are how people profiting uh, out of uh, Babylon, how they view God's judgment. So we looked at song one last session. This week, we're going to finish that bracketing bit, uh, the beginning and the end. And then our next session, we'll finish chapter 18 by looking at how people respond to the judgment of Babylon. So here's how it goes. It's uh, chapter uh, 18, verse 4. Um, then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. By the way, whenever in the Bible you see God remembering something, it means it's not that he ever forgot. It's a way of talking about the fact that um, justice has been delayed for mercy's sake, but not abandoned. That's what the word remembers. When it says that God remembers somebody's sins all the way through the Bible, that's what it's telling us, that it hasn't been that God ever forgot. And it wasn't as if God was going to give it a pass. And heaven will find out that it was for reasons of mercy and compassion that judgment was delayed or postponed by God's sovereign love but now he's remembered it. The time for judgment has come. The time of delay for mercy's sake has come to an end. Now it's time that God is going to act. So I'll just say that again. And God has remembered her iniquities. Verse 6, pay her back as she herself has paid back others and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning, that's uh, M-O-U, mourning, not M-O-R. Uh, in other words, uh, sorrow. In other words, you, and sorrow I shall never see. And by the way, as we're going to see, this is a very, very, very important part of the whole song at the beginning and the end. This, 
Uh, God revealing the self-understanding of earthly power organized in rebellion against the true and living God. Uh, that this is a, at the fundamental level of her heart, even as she's in a sense being devoured by the beast, even as she's coming under God's judgments, God, the, the earthly power is devoured by the beast and devoured by the devil purely because it is of the nature of the beast, uh, the, of the nature of the dragon to devour and to hate. But God's judgment upon earthly power is meant to call us to repentance. That's what it's meant for. It's meant for us to come to our senses and turn again that we might choose life, that we might choose life by choosing Jesus and his act upon the cross for us and the redemption and new life which is possible through him. But the, the, the beast, even under judgment, is saying to herself, uh, not the beast, the, the Babylon the great, the prostitute, even under judgment, even under destruction, says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and no mourning I shall, uh, I shall never see. Verse 8, for this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. So here's one of the very first things, and this is a, 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 a very important thing for every one of us human beings, because, you know, the fact of the matter is, is it's not as if this message of the beast is something which is foreign to human beings. It's, in fact, a, a great part of human beings that we ourselves think uh, that uh, we sit as a queen, so to speak, uh, that we are not a widow, and that uh, mourning we shall never see. In other words, that somehow or another, um, you know, we, we won't have to, we won't have to, uh, we won't have to repent. Um, we won't know death. We won't know sorrow. We're special and we're above things. And given that you will die, your pride is too great. You just think about the fact there was a time you didn't exist. Most of human history has existed without you even existing. Me too. And you will die. And the fact of the matter is, is that for every single human being, our pride is incommensurate, not in keeping with the fact that we are finite and that we will come to a death, that that is the fate of every human being. And, um, and so this is a very, very thing. It's hard for us to imagine powerful beings or or, uh, you know, you take the, the great uh, USSR, the great Russia, great China, great United States, but you have to remember, they all, they're in a sense just like the self, but magnified, but there was a time they didn't exist, and there will be a time they don't exist. And our pride is not in keeping with the fact that we are dependent and upon the fact that we are finite. Why are you and I so proud, given that we will die? In verse 6 here, when it says, uh, pay her back as she herself has paid back others, uh, in the original language, this is the language of a god or a goddess, that she views herself, earthly powers view themselves as, in a sense, almost being like God. And whatever they do, they're going to do right back. And when it goes on and talks about uh, verse 6, pay her back as she herself has paid back others and her pay her double for her deeds, uh, double just means a complete and full proper just justice. That's that's the imagery there. Just as remembering had a certain type of imagery, and dub doubling here has a certain type of imagery as well. And, uh, and the question is, is it fair to judge her? Look what it says in verse 8 again. Uh, For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. And uh, here's one of the things which is very, very interesting, and you can sort of see it here a little bit in the text. Because if you go back and you look, so you see there's a bit of a tension when you understand, want to understand God's judgment, and it's captured very well in this story. There's a bit of a, a, not a not maybe not, tension might not be the right word, but there's a little, you have to sort of balance two types of things or toggle back and forth between two different ideas. On one hand, there is the justice which God, is, it's proper to him, it's high justice, it's perfect justice, um, perfect clear justice. And then God also has, in a sense, his low justice. And both of them will find us guilty. And you notice here how it says, um, pay her back as she herself has paid back others. Uh, mix, a double for her, for her, mix a double portion for her in the cup, in the cup she mixed, you know. Um, uh, you, you have this idea uh, that, uh, you know, mix, repay her double for her deeds. So what the Bible text here is saying is, well, like, like, you know, there's like math, let's say, like very, very high math that I couldn't even pass, you know, 
and there's God's justice that nobody could ever possibly pass. And then we might say to God, well, God, it's not really fair for you to judge us by your high justice. Like, we didn't even know about it. We can't even conceive of how perfect and pure your real justice is. But here when it says pay her back as she paid back and, and deal with her the way she mixed, what the text is saying is that God uses her own judging criteria to judge her, and she still is judged. It's the same idea that's found in the book of Ro uh, Romans chapter 2, uh, but there it's philosophically described. Here it's seen in the context of a psalm and poetry. And it's as if God, at the, the day of judgment, God can say to every human being, they, they can say, well, I'm going to judge you by my justice, and you completely fail utterly. And then somebody says, well, that's not fair, God. I didn't grow up in the right culture. I didn't have the right type of education. How can you expect me to know the full, true, pure height of your justice? And then God says, well, okay, what we'll just do is we'll use your justice. We'll use your understanding of justice. We'll use the way that you judged the world and made decisions as the basis. That will be the standard by which you will be judged. And when God uses our own standard, we fail. We fail. And God judges us. And so in this whole text, because you have the God voice coming out of heaven, so you have this constant sense of God and his glory and his sovereignty and, uh, and, and the highness and, and the nearness of God at the same time. And then you have this wonderful text. Well, I mean, it's a frightening and sobering text that God, he will judge us, even if he judges us by our own standards of judgment, we will fail. So, uh, but what's, what's this whole thing at the end um, about people rejoicing. Look at that at University. Um, oh, sorry, d uh, we don't, haven't done the bit, little bit uh, 20 to 24. We'll do that very quickly. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. And uh, what that literally uh, says is God has judged the judgment of you from her. That's the same idea I was just trying to get across. Literally, in the original language, it says God has judged the judgment of you from her. Uh, and then it goes on, verse 21, Then a mighty angel took up a stone. That was the, the sixth song, by the way. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeteers will be heard in you no more. And craftsmen of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard if in you no more, and the light of a lamp will shine in you no more, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all the nations were deceived by your sorcery, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints, and of all who have been slain on earth. In other words, the love of death is essential to earthly power. The love of death and dealing of death is essential to earthly power in rebellion against the living God because God is the source of life. And so here's the thing. When death judges life, it finds it guilty and kills it. When death, when the powers of death come across life, death judges life, finds it guilty, and kills it. But what you see in the entire book of Revelation, it's going to culminate. It's all been talking about Jesus and he's our savior and the lamb who was slain and the lamb is going to come and the bride, which is going to be coming in chapter 19 and later on in the book of Revelation, that when life judges death, it is for the sake of life. And that what you see is that the great Babylon, the prostitute, kills so it can be exalted. But Jesus died so you and I can be exalted. Completely different worldview. The great prostitute kills ordinary people so it can be exalted. The Lord Jesus Christ came and humbled himself and died so you can be exalted when you put your faith and trust in him. Talk to you in a couple of days. God bless. Mm -hmm.